The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Catholics Believe, one of our catechetical programs, taken from a brief catechism for adults, this uh, by Father William Cogan, is called A Complete Handbook on How to Be a Good Catholic. These brief lessons uh, actually number no more than a couple of pages apiece, and uh, yet they do get to the essence of the doctrines of the faith. We've gotten to Lesson 16. The Catholic Church is the only true Church. And we begin with a citation from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answering said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hath not revealed this to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Again, St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 16 to 18. <clears throat> and we find later on in St. Matthew's Gospel, in fact, toward the, at the very end, we find our Lord's words addressed to his apostle on the occasion of his ascension into heaven. And Jesus coming spoke to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth, Going, therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And the first question of this lesson 16 is as follows. Can you learn to save your soul just by reading the Bible? The answer given here is no, because certain things in the Bible can be misunderstood and because the Bible does not include everything God taught. And those are two excellent reasons, among others, uh, to show that the Bible unto itself is insufficient. In fact, if we were to look at the history of the writing of the New Testament scriptures, we discover that uh, not only did the church exist before the first word of the first gospel was written down, but the church had existed already for 10, 15 years before the first gospel was written. And certainly, uh, uh, two generations, the church was established at least two generations before the, the last word of the last gospel was written. <clears throat> and all during this time, the church was functioning, was saving souls, was teaching mankind exactly as Christ had ordered it to do, ordered the apostles to do, preach the gospel to every nation, and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and instruct them to observe all things that Christ had commanded them. Uh, when they tell you here, and the answer to number one, certain things in the Bible can be misunderstood, well, they're actually uh, just pointing out what St. Peter says, that no interpretation of Scripture is done by private initiative. It's not to individuals to interpret the Scriptures for themselves, but rather it is a matter of the Church, the authority that Christ gave the Church to preach the Gospel, to interpret, to interpret the words of divine revelation. Uh, our Lord sent the Holy Ghost upon the Apostles to enlighten them, to bring to their minds clearly whatever He had taught them. And so there is a magisterium in the church. There is a magisterial authority, a teaching authority in the church. And uh, not everyone has that. That is given to those who are received it directly from our Lord himself or have succeeded them in the church. And so there certainly are things in the Bible that can be misunderstood. And as a matter of fact, again, St. Peter talks about St. Paul's Gospels as being very obscure. And he even talks about how, even then, at the time of the Apostles, even during the lifetime of St. Paul, uh, people were 
twisting the words of St. Paul, misinterpreting them, and, and were applying them unto their own damnation, their own condemnation, St. Peter says. So again, to interpret the Word of God is not the prerogative of just anybody who can read, picks up the Bible, and starts uh, expounding on what it means to him in that particular day. No, not at all. There is a true understanding of what our Lord's words mean, what God's words mean in the Gospel, in the uh, words of sacred scripture, and there are false interpretations. And our Lord has given us authority to be able to tell us here on earth the difference between what is the true interpretation and what are the false interpretations of his own word. But we also know that the Bible does not include everything that God taught. As a matter of fact, the Bible could not possibly include everything that God has taught. St. John ends his gospel with those words that the entire world could not hold the ball of the books that would have to be written to record all the words and actions of our Lord Jesus Christ. And one might say he was speaking by way of hyperbole, but the fact is he was speaking to indicate to us that there is much that our Lord taught and much that our Lord did that is not related in the words of sacred scripture. And uh, actually, we need no, look no farther than sacred scripture itself. As I pointed out in a treatment of this question of sola scriptura, the Bible alone, the Bible itself makes it very clear that it does not contain all that Jesus said and did. In fact, nowhere does the Bible claim to, com to contain everything that our Lord wrote. Our, our Lord, I'm sorry, our Lord did not write anything that is recorded in the Bible. None of that was written by our Lord himself. <clears throat> and when he sent out his apostles, he did not send them out with the command to go write down the Gospels. They did so under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost later on. <clears throat> in St. Peter's case, it was St. Mark who recorded his words. And St. Peter, according to the words of one of the fathers of the church, St. Jerome, St. Peter himself read the writings of St. Mark, St. Mark's recordings, uh, of his St. Peter's words while he was preaching the gospel in Rome. St. Peter approved it and ordered it read as a gospel in the church, the, the words of St. Peter. Uh, as St. Justin Martyr refers to them uh, in the early second half of the second century, they are the memoirs of the apostles. But more than being the memoirs of the apostles, they... Uh, they also have divine inspiration behind them, so they really are the Word of God. But the Bible tells us that our Lord was uh, here on earth for 40 days from his resurrection to his ascension, that he taught the apostles about the kingdom of heaven here on earth, the church, <clears throat> and yet we find that very little of what our Lord taught during that time is actually written down. It has all come down to us, but it has come down to us by way of sacred tradition. When the faith is conveyed by word of mouth, by preaching, when the faith is conveyed by any other medium uh, uh, than writing, it is called sacred tradition. So we find the tradition of faith before the New Testament Gospels or any of the epistles are written. We find the New Testament faith was given by word of mouth, by preaching, and by the monuments of the faith that were left for us. This is what we know as sacred tradition. In fact, the New Testament scriptures came out of sacred tradition. They are the product of sacred tradition, which came first. Remember, you have, just have to remember, the church came first. Before any one book, any gospel, any epistle, of the New Testament, New Testament were written. The church was already there, working, saving souls, and following the uh, commands of Christ in the persons of the apostles and those whom they themselves had ordained, and those they, they themselves had, had baptized and had received into the faith. So uh, when they ask you with this first question, can you learn to save your soul only by reading the Bible? The answer has to be no. There's more. <clears throat> there is much that Christ taught that is not contained in the Bible, and what he has recorded for us in sacred scripture must be authoritatively interpreted, so even those writings we understand correctly. There are many other proofs of the fact that the scriptures cannot stand alone. 
<clears throat> that even though they are the word of God, it is true, and the Catholic Church has always defended them as such, even defending them unto death in the case of many great uh, saints and martyrs. Nonetheless, the Church understands that these were committed to the Church. And when our Lord tells us, even in the Gospel themselves, why He came, the Son of God became man, to die on the cross for us and to establish His Church. And so the, the sacred scriptures are the result of the tradition of that Church and are in the custody of that Church to translate to propagate and to interpret. Now, number two, what did Jesus do to make sure that his teaching would never be misunderstood? The answer they give in the book is he established a church. And we quote from the first epistle of St. Paul to St. Timothy, chapter 3, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Words of St. Paul to one of his first young bishops, Timothy. The church is the pillar and ground of truth, as the church was founded on the apostles. That's what we mean when we say the church must be one holy Catholic and apostolic. <clears throat> and it has come down through the ages with the, the authority that Christ has given to his apostles, that authority continuing in his true church. Number three, when did Jesus establish his church? The answer is nearly 2,000 years ago. In fact, the tradition is that our Lord spoke of establishing his church, but actually did so when he died on the cross. St. Augustine talks about that. He, he talks about the blood and the water that flowed from the side of our Lord, which was pierced by the lands, as actually being the birth of the church. He even compares it to the the account of the creation of Eve from the side of Adam that Adam slept, and God drew from Ad his side, Adam's side, the woman who would be his companion, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And uh, just as St. Uh, Augustine says, just as God drew the new life, Eve, from the side of the sleeping Adam, so God drew the church from the side of the sleeping Christ, Christ sleeping in death upon the cross. And he says, in the form of blood and water it came forth, water symbolizing the sacrament of baptism, the beginning, and the blood symbolizing the Holy Eucharist, that is, the consummation of all the sacraments, uh, in, the, in the blood of Christ, in our reception of the body and blood of Christ in Holy Communion. So the idea that Christ established his church at a given moment, and that moment being when our Lord died on the cross and accomplished the work of the redemption uh, and actually then uh, obtained the, the, uh, the redemption which he was going to send his church to proclaim and to effect throughout the world. It's the moment that Christ established his church. For how many churches did Jesus establish? The answer is only one. Uh, we quote here from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 10. Upon this rock I will build my church, singular, St. Matthew chapter 16, rather, and St. John chapter 10, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Again, the fact is, when Christ referred to his church, he refers to it, to it only in the singular, not the plural. Those who would multiply the church into various fragments are more Gnostics than they are Christians, as our Lord never spoke of his churches. He only spoke of one, that is his church, faithful to him. And so we, as true followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, believe that there is one true God who has given us his one true Son as our one true sacrifice, who has established his one true Church, and that is the Catholic Church. Number five, how long did Jesus plan his Church to last? Evidently, the end of the world, until the end of the world. And again, we quote St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, I am with you all days even to the consummation of the world, the consummation that is the world coming to its last minute and fulfilling its entire purpose, coming to its end. This creation, <clears throat> the church will last that long. But we have to remember also that when we're talking about the church lasting until the end of the world, 
we're talking about what we refer to commonly as the church militant, because the church militant must itself grow and pass on to the church <clears throat> after the death of her followers. Uh, the church will be the church suffering and the church triumphant. And finally, in the end, once the church triumphant itself is is all that remains, that is, all the souls who are to be saved are going to be in the beatific vision of God in heaven. That will be the final and permanent state of the church in union with God in heaven. This is the image that is given to us in the book of the Apocalypse, sometimes oddly referred to as the book of Revelation. I mean, all the books of the Bible are books of Revelation. Uh, the Catholic Church has always referred to it as the book of the Apocalypse because that Greek term refers to the hidden things, the mysterious things of God. And here we're talking about the mysterious things of the future. So I will always refer to the last book of the Bible as the book of the Apocalypse, the traditional Catholic term for that book. And uh, there we find represented for us the heavenly Jerusalem as a bride adorned for her husband, God. And uh, this is the state of the blessed souls in heaven, the church triumphant. Now, when we get to purgatory, we will address the question of uh, uh, what happens to those who are still alive at the end of the world and uh, what will happen to purgatory if uh, finally there are those at the end of the world who are going to suffer death then, the separation of the soul and the body. Everyone must, even those who survive till the end of, end of time, will have to undergo death. And the question is then, but if time is over and, uh, and finished, and uh, this creation is finished, what becomes of their purgatory? Well, uh, to, to say quite simply, I, I think we need to remember here that our Lord says that the souls who are surviving and who are faithful there at the very end will be so holy. Actually, St. Saint, uh, Saint Louis de Montfort tells us they'll have to be so holy their love for God so complete and so pure that they will make the saints of the early persecutions under the Roman Empire look like little shrubs in comparison with the sanctity of those required at the end of the world, which will be like the cedars of Lebanon, he says. And from that we will understand, I think we're given to understand, that the saints who hold to the faith, hold fast to the faith in those last days, will have to have a perfect love for God, to have any love for God at all. We'll have to have a perfect love for God to have any faith at all. And this would explain why, when those souls die, there will be no purgatory for them, because they will love God with their whole heart, their whole mind, their whole soul, their whole strength. And uh, therefore, with that perfect love, they would have perfect contrition for any sins they committed, they will not need any purgatory. But in any case, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here in dealing with that question. <clears throat> I just want to address this, this one um, answer they give, though, that the church that Christ established will last till the end of time. There we're talking uniquely of the church militant. Then the church militant will pass into the uh, church triumphant, finally. And that will be the final and perpetual the, the everlasting state of the church and the souls who are faithful to Christ. The church triumphant. Six, how did Jesus establish his church? And the answer, by giving his authority to the apostles to rule and to teach. And again, St. Matthew chapter 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Saying these words, our Lord sent his apostles out to preach the gospel to all mankind every single human being on the face of the earth, even until the end of time, would be the, uh, the ones to, the, to whom they were directed by Christ. And so uh, this authority that Christ gave them, and giving them the command, the responsibility, he also gave them the authority. Just the other day, I was talking to a, a couple who um, had fallen into the born-again Christian, fundamentalist Christian uh, mode of thinking. And I did ask them um, how they explain in the fundamentalist born-again Christian milieu, 
of their understanding of the Bible, Scripture, and individual interpretation, and so on. And uh, a kind of a loose-knit, um, I don't know uh, what you'd call it, even just uh, kind of an invisible society of believers around the world, um, vaguely believing in Christ, uh, waving, holding up the Bible and saying this is what they believe, but of course they don't all interpret the same way. How they, how they uh, somehow reconcile that with our Lord's very clear command in that Bible they're holding. St. Matthew chapter 28, when he commanded his apostles to go and to preach the gospel, giving them the authority to do so, not those who necessarily graduate from Bob Jones University or Liberty University. That's not Christ giving the command, the power, and the authority to preach the gospel. But Christ himself to his own apostles, right there, it's stated explicitly in the scriptures. And Christ telling the apostles to sanctify souls, beginning with the power of baptism. And Christ ordering them to order others to obey the laws that Christ has taught them and the way they are to live, the morals, the doctrines and faith and morals that Christ gave to the apostles. Therefore, Christ ordered them then to give to all mankind. How do born-again Christians and fundamentalist Christians and so on who reject this church and the authority given to the apostles, how can they claim that they therefore belong to the church that Christ established as he established it on the apostles. And the argument of these dear people was, well, that all changed. Somewhere along the line, that all changed. And Christ changed it. He changed himself. <clears throat> so the point is, therefore, that what Christ has related to us in the sacred scriptures, which they claim to hold by, that's been changed now to something else of their own imagining. And what Christ said in the Bible, which they say they adhere to, and which they follow religiously, that that no longer applies, that that has fallen by the wayside, that when our Lord told them, the apostles, I will be with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world, Christ changed his mind. Well, this is blasphemy. I don't even think they realize it, but it's blasphemy. Where do they get this idea that somewhere along the line Christ changed things? So that just anybody, anywhere, who can, uses the name of Christ, can claim himself to be an apostle. I mean, you know, St. Paul talks about some are given to be teachers, and some are given to heal, and some are given to be prophets, and some are given these various things, but they're given these by God. They're given these by the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> but not all are apostles. And not all have these various uh, missions and charisms by Christ. Uh, so that's what St. Paul says in the sacred scriptures. But now, to hear the born-agains and the fundamentalists talk, everybody should be speaking in tongues and healing and so on, if you had faith. How do they reconcile that with the scriptures they claim to follow? Well, the fact is, they can't because they really don't follow the scriptures, honestly. Uh, number seven, uh, Oh, number six, I'm sorry. How did Jesus establish his church? Giving that authority to his apostles. Read it yourself. Open your Bibles. St. Matthew chapter 28. Go to the very end. You'll read our Lord's command at his ascension. Number seven, did the people have to obey the apostles? Yes, they did. Christ told them, he who hears you, hears me. That's what our Lord said to them. And they do have to obey the apostles because they spoke with the authority of Christ. And therefore, to disobey them would be a sin. And here we read from the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 10. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. <clears throat> so here's a very clear-cut statement by our Lord in the gospel according to St. Luke that to hear the apostles is to hear Jesus himself, and to hear our Lord is to hear the Father who sent him. To reject the apostles and the teaching of the apostles is to reject our Lord, and to reject our Lord is to reject the Father who sent him. He couldn't be clearer than that. And certainly <clears throat> those who hold to the banner of Protestantism even if they don't like the name, if they're still holding the principles of Protestantism, all based on Scripture alone, 
That's the fundamental principle of all Protestants and all Protestantism. If they hold to that, they do reject the authority of the apostles because they say the only authority left to them is written in the Bible. Where is the authority? Where is the apostolic authority? It is in the church, even now. And the modernists know that too. And they're trying to abuse that, abuse that to bludgeon the Catholic people into falling into their modernism rather than their Catholic, following their Catholicism of the apostles. We'll talk about that later. Number eight, did the authority of the apostles die with them? The answer, no, they, they handed their authority down to others. Since Jesus Christ instituted his church to last until the end of the time, end of time, here in this world. And here we have a quotation of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Some of the men who received authority from the apostles, Matthias, they named him. And the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas also received authority from the apostles. Timothy, Silas, and Silvanus, Titus, Luke, Mark, again, Acts 17, re, uh, records the fact that these men also received authority and commissions from the apostles. To do what? To do what Christ had commanded them to do. We're also directed to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 14. What is the point of this? The point is, if you read the Acts of the Apostles, the book of the Bible that comes immediately after the Gospels. You read what the Apostles did. And after our Lord's ascension and the coming of the Holy Ghost upon them, they knew what to do. Even before Pentecost Sunday in, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, Peter was already, already stating what it was necessary to do. He said it was necessary to choose someone to take Judas's place. How did Peter know that? The only way we can understand that Peter knew to do that, this is even before Pentecost Sunday, is that Christ our Lord had commanded this, had instructed the apostles. But Peter was already making these decisions. Read, read the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, you'll see for yourself. Peter was already making these decisions. And when in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, the Holy Ghost had come, it was Peter who stood up and confronted the people of Jerusalem. Yes, the very Peter who denied even knowing our Lord, cursing and swearing that he had never known him. Just days before, here's Peter addressing not only the residents of Jerusalem, but the Jews from all over the empire. <clears throat> Peter was the one preaching to them. If you keep reading in the Acts of the Apostles, here's what you find you find that the apostles took men aside and ordained them. And we are told how? That they placed their hands on the heads, signifying the giving of a spiritual power and enlightenment. And while they were doing that, that gesture, they prayed to the Holy Ghost to come upon these men they were ordaining and bring them and confer upon them the powers that Christ had given them. And you find that in the Acts of the Apostles, in those passages that I mentioned just now. The Apostles were commissioning others to do what Christ had commissioned them to do. The Apostles were conveying to others the powers that Christ had given them. How did they know to do this? They were guided by the Holy Ghost to do this, and they may well have been instructed by our Lord explicitly, word for word, during those 40 days that our Lord taught them before his ascension. In any case, they knew what to do, and that is what they did. They, they passed on that spiritual power. Read the epistles to Timothy. Read the epistle to Titus. You'll see it spelled out right there. Number nine, which church today has the same authority? The answer, the Catholic Church, because it is the only church which was established by Christ that goes back to the apostles that recognizes this divine authority. As a matter of fact... Even apart from all the other arguments, one, one can honestly say that the Catholic Church is the only church which has ever claimed to have the apostolic authority. I mean the Orthodox churches which broke away from the Catholic Church a thousand years ago. Um, they would claim it too, but, but they claimed to have it in common with the Catholic Church before they broke away. 
And they recognized that that authority had to come from the apostles also. But among the Protestant so-called churches, you'll never find a Protestant church that claims they have, they have the, uh, the authority from Christ, the apostles, the apostolic authority, in any hierarchy, in any clergy, in any ministry. Um, their ministers basically are part-time job, or they're hired by boards of people. Uh, they basically just have degrees in, in ministry uh, from universities, but they haven't received any commission from the apostles themselves or from Christ themselves, other than what they imagine themselves to be. They, they crown themselves as though minister, they were ministers of Christ. But they cannot claim any apostolic lineage, going back to the apostles, who were told by Christ to preach the gospel to all nations. <clears throat> they just arrogate it to themselves these days. At the same time they do that, they blame the Catholic Church for pretending to have the apostolic authority. But they're actually admitting something about the Catholic Church. The fact is the Catholic Church is the only church, Christian church throughout history who has ever steadfastly, consciously, deliberately, knowingly, and unwaveringly claimed to have the authority from Christ that has claimed to have the authority of the apostles, no matter what has happened, even at the expense of life itself. Her priests, her bishops, her popes have claimed to have the responsibility conferred by Jesus Christ himself and the responsibility, the authority that comes with it also to preach, to govern, and to sanctify all of mankind. It's a very claim that Protestants reject and, and actually become angry. They become angry and irritated with the Catholic Church for claiming to have this authority. But my question is, why would you want a church that could not and did not claim that? What good would be a church claiming to have Christ and follow Christ that could not and did not claim that authority? that it has come from the apostles themselves who were commanded by Christ to preach, to govern, and sanctify all the nations of the world. The very thing that the world uh, resents about the Catholic Church is the thing that they should admire. It's the thing that should give them confidence. The Catholic Church is the only church that has ever pretended to even have this authority. Uh, my goodness, once uh, I was on a, when I just arrived in Cincinnati back in 1984, I was asked to be on a live radio, a live television program, I should say, a live television program uh, with various uh, regi religions represented. Okay, there was a campus minister from the Lutheran Church on this panel. And during a break, a commercial break, he and I got into a little discussion. We were about the same age at that time, and I told him, it must be difficult for you to try to talk to college students these days about morality, especially matters of purity, uh, speaking to them about, about moral life, their moral life, being faithful to Christ and refusing to give in to the temptations to immor well, sexual immorality. His reaction to me said it all. He said, oh, we, we can't do that. I said, what, what do you mean? Well, he said, we can't tell them what's right and wrong. We have no right or authority to presume to tell them, the college students, what's right and what's wrong. And I thought, well, what good is that? What are you for? What's the point? Why would anybody want a religion that couldn't tell you the difference between right and wrong, and uh, even even was embarrassed to suggest that it might have the authority to do so. Um, what good is that? Well, the Catholic Church is the one true church, and it acts, it has always acted as the one true church, even at its lowest points in history, when it was suffering the most terrible betrayals from outside and from within by popes, bishops, and priests, even at those lowest points, the Catholic Church nonetheless still conducted itself as claiming its true identity 
even if the priests and the bishops and the popes were condemning their own lives, they always, always had the awareness that this is the one true church of Christ with the authority that Christ gave it. Even if they had to blush with shame because they were not living up to it. The church, the Catholic church, the only church that actually has claimed throughout its entire history to be the one true church of Christ, have that responsibility to preach, govern, and sanctify all mankind, and therefore to have the, the authority to do so. Um, there is no other religion claiming the name of Christ that, that has steadfastly uh, made that claim. And for that I would say, what good are they if they can't even claim that? Anyway, excuse my <clears throat> um, digression there, but it, uh, it seems ironic, to the, say the least, that the very thing that should make people admire the church would say that is the church that must be the church of Christ because it's the only one that's ever really claimed to be in all of its, in all of its life, in, in, in the, 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 the high points and the low. It's the only church that is steadily, without flinching, claim to be even in the face of death and persecution. And why would, I, why would I want a church that couldn't claim that? In any case, number 11. Does everyone have to obey the Catholic Church? And the answer is, yes, insofar as it is the church that Christ established, then yes, just as everyone has to obey Christ, then when everyone has to obey the church that he established. As he said, he who hears you hears me. That's what he said to the apostles. And if it is the apostolic authority that functions in the church, then that must be kept. Right? Yeah. But uh, one might at this point be asking, well, gee, what about the modernists who are now in power in the Vatican? Do we have to follow them? Well, again, in, in a nutshell, I would just say this. Uh, do they represent the apostolic authority or do they represent the rejection of the apostolic authority? To us who follow the traditional faith, the modernists represent the rejection of the apostolic authority, the perversion of apostolic authority, and they must not be followed. They manifestly do not follow the apostolic authority of St. Peter, St. James, St. John, St. Andrew, and so on, as the church has always known it to be. Um, now, number 12, where did the Protestant churches come from? Protestant churches were basically uh, just a protest. That's all they are. That's what they call called, protest. They're protesting churches. Their religions built upon a protest. If one were to say, what was the, what was the, 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 the birth the, uh, that brought forth the, uh, let me put it this way, what was the gestation of the Protestant church that brought it to birth? The answer was, Protest. It's just protest. How do you build a religion or a church on protest? Protesting another religion. That's what it was. We're told that Protestantism was born when Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the cathedral, the Catholic cathedral in Wittenberg, Wittenberg, Germany. That was the birth of Protestantism. It was a protest. Um... It's embarrassing to think of a religion and a church, well, in this case, zillions of churches, thousands and thousands of different churches, disagreeing among themselves, <clears throat> actually, all begun as a form of protest. And the Protestant churches were established by men who had no authority to start churches on their own. Number 13, who started the first Protestant church? They tell you the first Protestant church was established less than 500 years ago in Germany by Martin Luther in 1520. Now there were other heretics who had gone before Martin Luther. Of course, there had always been heretics who denied teachings of the faith. Um, we think of Zwingli. Uh, we think of uh, actually. Um, uh, uh, we think of Huss, John Huss. We think of Wycliffe, Huss in Bohemia, Wycliffe. In, uh, in England in the 1300s. And uh, we think of others who went before all the way, all the way back to the very early centuries. Um, there were always heretics. 
But to actually start religions on the basis of their heresies, well, uh, we have to give Martin Luther the um, disgraceful title of a heresiarch here. Uh, it was in 1517 that he began this protest, uh, publicly, went public with it. And the book says it was less than 500 years ago. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, very soon we'll begin the year 2017. That'll be the 500th anniversary. And uh, we'd already know that Francis is going to travel to Sweden to actually take part in the Lutheran Cathedral in Lund, Sweden, to celebrate or to commemorate the 500 years of Protestantism, the 500th anniversary of Luther nailing the protest, 95 theses of protest against the Catholic Church and the Catholic religion to a Catholic cathedral. One might ask, how could a Catholic pontiff, a successor of St. Peter, the vicar of Christ, go to join in such a celebration? Even if Francis says he's not celebrating, He's joining in a celebration because that's what the occasion is. That's what the Lutheran ministers are going to be doing in the Lutheran cathedral in Lund, Sweden. They're going, to be, they're going to be rejoicing. They're going to be celebrating. And Francis is going to be joining them. And if one asks, how can a Catholic pontiff join in such a celebration? And I'd say that's a very good question. How can a Catholic pontiff join in such a celebration? How could he even suggest such a thing? And I would dare say a Catholic pontiff cannot simply put, join in such a celebration. Number 14, name the founders of other leading Protestant churches. And here they give you in the book, the Episcopalian Church, founded by King Henry VIII in 1534, founded in England. It was the Anglican Church for the English. Again, how sectarian can you get? A national church. Exactly what Christ himself did not found, a national church. He didn't even send his apostles out with the words, go preach the gospel to all the people of your Jewish heritage or ancestry. No, to all nations, the Gentiles as well. But here we have Henry establishing a church of his own, of which he was to be the king, the head of the church for the English, exactly what Christ did not establish. <clears throat> the name of the church, Presbyterian, founded by John Knox in 1560, again in Scotland. Congregationalist, founded by Robert Brown in the year 1583 in England. The Baptist, founded by John Smith in 1600 in Holland. The Methodist, founded by John Wesley in 1739 in England. The Adventist, founded by William Miller in 1831 in New York. Christian Scientist, founded by Barry Baker Eddy in 1879 in Massachusetts. And so the history of Protestantism tends more and more to fractioning and fractioning. It, it is well, what would one expect? I mean, if everyone is told that it's the Bible alone that they follow and everybody interprets it for himself, then you'd expect to have as many different Protestant religions as you have Protestants. Practical points. Number one, a non-Catholic who suspects that the Catholic Church is the one true Church of God and who does not investigate her claims with a mind to join if her claims prove to be true cannot be saved. Because outside of Christ's mystical body, outside of the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. There is no salvation. And so they make it very clear, apart from all other questions, that someone who, is, who knowingly refuses to join the true Church that Christ established, clearly, cannot claim any part in Christ and has no claim on salvation whatsoever. Two, a non-Catholic who, through no fault of his own, does not realize that the Catholic Church is the only true Church, and who dies with sanctifying grace in his soul, will go to heaven, 
since Christ died for all, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Still, those who are not visibly members of the Catholic Church have many difficulties trying to save their souls without the guidance of the Church, which cannot teach error, and without her sacraments, of which baptism imparts the life of God to the soul, that is, the life of God's sanctifying grace. And the other sacraments add to the sanctifying grace in the soul, and confirm it, they take away sins, and also give other graces that enable a person to do good and avoid sin. Now, this uh, today is rather, has been made rather controversial by Father Leonard Feeney, who denied the existence of what had been called baptism of desire and baptism of blood. I'm not going to get into that question right now. You might say I already have. The book has, certainly. But I'm not going to treat of this question right now, because that will be covered when we get into the, this question of the sacrament of baptism. Remember our Lord said to his apostles, going, baptizing the nations of the world in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. So baptism is the beginning, and we're going to be treating that very soon. I will just say this, though, on, on this one point, just so you bear this in mind, okay? The Catechism of the Council of Trent, which was finally brought to completion and published by St. Pius V himself in the year 1566, the very year that, that he became the Supreme Pontiff, Pope Pius V. That catechism, the Council of Trent, addresses the question of the baptism of adults. And it states with absolute clarity in Latin, and uh, the translation that you find in the Catechism of the Council of Trent uh, makes it, it is a perfect translation of the Latin, uh, of the original. And I, I've seen actually uh, the, uh, reproduced the, the text from the very first edition, 1566, that says <clears throat> that if a catechumen that is someone preparing for baptism but not yet baptized. If a catechumen as a convert dies before he's received the waters of baptism, and it's not his fault, either that he dies or he dies before that he received baptism, then there is still hope that he has been saved. Why? Because the church teaches that his intention to receive the sacrament, his contrition for his sin, will avail him of grace and justification. Now, you couldn't get clearer than that. In fact, this is exactly what the Catechism says, is the reason why the Church does not feel the urgency to baptize a catechumen adult who has already made known his intention to be baptized. But he just has to learn the faith in its fullness to have the, the, the instruction of the faith in order to qualify for baptism. Every convert to the faith has to, first of all, learn the faith, determine that he believes it, and determine that he will live according to it, that he accept the doctrines of faith and that he will also live according to the, do the doctrines of morals of the church. Until the convert is well instructed in that, then for the church does not baptize him. But the Catechism of the Council of Trent tells us why. Because the intention to be baptized and his true contrition for his sins will avail him of grace and justice. And so um, the sanctifying grace of God will be there. Uh, just keep that in mind. If you want a copy of that, I'd be glad to give you a copy of those words from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, from the, in the original Latin, under St. Pius V himself. Number three, you should try to bring others to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy chapter 2, by prudently suggesting that they take instructions in the true religion. If you find uh, someone who is well disposed... Um, someone you have brought to at least 
suspect that the Catholic Church might well be the true church. And the Catholic faith may well be the true faith that Christ taught. If you bring someone by your knowledge of apologetics and your charitable discussions with them, to be open to that possibility, then you should follow up on that by letting them know that they should, that there's a moral obligation for them to look into it and invite them to receive instruction in the faith. Make it possible, contact a priest for them who you think would be good for them. Um, and uh, see if you can't bring them together and, and at least get them started there. And don't be shy about it. I'm going to conclude this chapter 16 now, this lesson 16. I'll just mention uh, one case of uh, someone who did just that, uh, a woman who mentioned to her husband uh, the fact that she would be delighted if he saw fit to enter the Catholic Church. And this was a gentleman who had been attending the traditional Mass with her for years, without fail. <clears throat> and uh, always came in suit and tie and showed a lot of respect for the religion, the altar, the faith, the Blessed Sacrament, even though he did not profess the Catholic religion. Hardly even talked about it. But his action showed something there. This went on for years. And one day, uh, this dear lady told me, I don't know what to do. My, my good husband is, is uh, attending Mass faithfully and uh, shows all the reverence for the faith. And yet he never mentions it to me, and I never really mention it to him. Uh, and I, I told her, well, why don't you invite him to become a Catholic? And she said, well, I'm afraid how he would react. I'm afraid that if I put him on the spot like that, uh, he'll react negatively. That, that then I'll find out why all these years he has not become a Catholic, and he'll start telling me all his objections. And I don't want to trigger a reaction like that by inviting him. I said, well, look, you know, you have to trust in the grace of God here. Obviously, there have been graces given over the years, so you, you can't underestimate the grace of God, and you can't uh, be an obstacle in the way, or at least uh, unresponsive to a grace if God is giving it to you. So uh, why don't you do this? Why don't you write him a little note? Why don't you assume that maybe he's not brought it up to you because no one's brought it up to him, including you. For all you know, maybe he's just waiting for someone to ask. For all you know, maybe he just thinks that we don't think he'd make a very good Catholic. Whatever. Um, you'll never know until you ask. So I said, why don't you write him a little note? If you write him a little note, you can write it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Pray to God, throw holy water on the envelope. Um, you can say uh, exactly what you think should be said finally in your final version of it. Uh, pray about it and uh, enclose it with prayers and, uh, and confidence in God and leave it for him to find. And then if he reads it and gets upset, well, he'll have the opportunity to reread it and to reread it, and he can't misinterpret or like I misquote you. He can't interrupt you. What you've written is right there. You have a record of that. What you've written there. If he gets upset about it, he'll have a chance to calm down. And if he never brings it up again, well, that's the way it goes. That's what you tr you try though. You certainly don't want to go to your own judgment and find out there that the reason why your dear husband never converted is because of something you did not do. Because of something you failed to do. So uh, she said, well, okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's right, she said. So she said, tomorrow's his birthday, I'll write in the card something about him becoming a Catholic. Something gentle about him becoming a Catholic. And she did. And she called me back later and said that he found the birthday card 
And uh, the next thing she knew, he came to her with the birthday card, and he was very moved by it. And as it turns out, uh, as I recall, she said that he, uh, he really did take it to heart, and his reaction was something to the effect of, well, I guess I never either, I either didn't think about it, or I didn't know that it was really that important to you, and it should be that important to me, because no one ever said anything. But that was the, the gist of what he said. Nobody ever brought it up to me. So I just never brought it up to anybody else. I never said anything. I guess I was waiting for an invitation, as though I was waiting to be considered worthy to be invited to be a Catholic. Well, the one thing's for sure, if we have uh, relatives, friends, acquaintances, anyone who um, might, might become a member of the, of the true church that Christ established, by anything we might do or say, be, be moved in that direction, that would be a great grace and there will be a great reward for that. But we'll all be very shamefaced if we appear before our Lord and find out that one of the things he has against us, we read this in the early chapters of the book of the Apocalypse, where our Lord says, I have this against thee, I have this against thee. But we don't want our Lord to be saying that against us, when we appear for judgment, that I have this against thee, that your spouse, your child, your parent, your brother, your sister, your friends, your co-workers, they would have responded, but they never did because they had nothing to respond to because you failed. You failed them and you failed me. God forbid that any of us should ever hear that from Christ. So if they don't, they don't. But let's make sure it's not because of something we failed to do. Uh, the most important thing of all we, that we have to do is to pray for them. So that's where we all have to begin, by praying for them. We can give them the most eloquent sermons on faith. We can give them the most powerful rational arguments for the truth of the Catholic Church. But if God does not give the internal grace for them to receive what we say in the right spirit, then all of our efforts will be lost. And so we have to prepare the soil first because if we're going to take the seed of faith and try to bury it in concrete, put it on the rock, put it on the wayside, it's going to be lost. And that's where our prayers come in. We have to use our prayers to help prepare the good soil so that the seed of faith that we're hoping to plant there will be able to grow, live, thrive, and eventually bring forth eternal life. May God bless you.